Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The final review in the classic Resident Evil game trilogy. It feels good to be done with these. This has been a monumental task for me and I just wanted to thank everyone for supporting the channel. From the bottom of my heart, it means so much. Since this is the final review, this means we are talking about Code Veronica- Wait, no, not that, no, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. That is what we are talking about. Not that other thing. Beginning these reviews four months ago was one of the biggest challenges for me. Tackling such an iconic franchise was at times overwhelming, but here we are. Again, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been watching these videos. These have easily been the hardest and most time consuming videos I've ever made and it makes me so happy you guys are enjoying them. Now with all those niceties out of the way, let's get started. Today, in this little video of mine, I'm going to be reviewing Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Released only two years after the amazing Resident Evil 2, which you can watch my review for as I will shove a link in the description. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis had a lot to live up to and expectations were astronomically high after the success of the predecessors. But with such a short time between the two games, will it live up to that hype? Well, let's find out. Before we get into this, I just wanted to let everyone know that you can support the channel on Patreon for as little as $1. You will get access to bonus content and my Discord as well. More on that at the end of the video. And thank you to those who still contribute during the thing YouTube doesn't like us talking about. It means so much. The story of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, which I'm just going to call Resident Evil 3 from now on because fucking it's too long of a name, is a little bit interesting as it takes place before and after the events of Resident Evil 2. The first half of the game occurs 24 hours prior to RE2, while the second half happens two days after. But I will just give the plot set up, early parts of the narrative, introduce the main characters and my opinions to avoid spoilers. But if you just want my opinion, firstly, thank you and you're cute, and secondly, skip to this time code. Okay, strap in. Postpone your psychologist's appointment and let's go. Jill is just having the worst time. After the events of Resident Evil 1, her and her fellow STARS members reported to Chief Irons about the shenanigans that went down, but he was having none of it, and it's not because he's a shady guy. I don't know what would suggest that. As was explored in Resident Evil 2, little does Jill know that the city's rats and water supply have been infected with the T-Virus, which has led to, well, this. While chilling inside her home, Jill decides she ain't got time for this and it's time to actually escape Raccoon City. After she dives out of her exploding apartment complex, she makes her way to a warehouse where she meets a lovely dude named Dario Rosso, whose mother, wife and daughter have been turned into zombie food. Gotta say, Dario got out of a lot of responsibilities real fast. The pair chill for a day, make some small talk about their dead friends and family, but Jill soon realises that hunkering down isn't the best idea as this is a Resident Evil game and that never works out well. She tells Dario that she's going to try and find a way out and he should tag along, but Dario doesn't want to end up like his family and has a hissy fit before running into the back of a truck. <coughs> Jill's like, fuck this guy, and unlocks one of the entrances to the warehouse and begins to explore the city streets. She doesn't go back to lock the door to the warehouse again, so Dario doesn't get eaten, but Jill is a professional so I'm sure he will be fine. As she is cruising around the destroyed streets of Raccoon City, she bumps into her star's colleague Brad Vickers, you know, the guy that left her on a team for dead in the first game. Nice fellow that one. Brad tells her about something that is after star's members and they are all gonna die. He doesn't explicitly say that, but knowing this series, the team isn't being chased by a fucking Care Bear. Jill makes her way to the entrance of a familiar location, the Raccoon City Police Department, where she runs into Brad again, looking a bit scared. He tells her to run as a giant leather-wearing BDSM monster known as Nemesis appears. He grabs Brad and Resident Evil 3 turns into tentacle porn for a moment. Jill fucks around in the RPD and after she leaves, she runs into yet another person. This time it's a mercenary named Carlos Oliveira, who works for Umbrella's biohazard countermeasure service. Since he works for Umbrella and that company and Jill have a bit of a complicated history, she doesn't trust him. But after he helps her with another encounter with Hentai Boy, she reckons Carlos is a good bloke. The pair make their way to a nearby tram where Carlos' colleagues are hanging out. You got Captain Mikhail Victor, who has been injured and that's his entire character. This looks bad. And Sergeant Nikolai Zenoviv who is so obviously the bad guy that he makes Nemesis look like a hero. They reveal their plan to Jill. If the mercenary's mission were to fail, which it most certainly has at this point, they were told to escape via a helicopter which would pick them up near the clock tower. But unfortunately, they can't get there as the streets are too dangerous and the tram is no longer working. So Jill and Carlos are tasked with getting the tram up and running again so they can escape. All the while, Jill is being hunted down by Nemesis. At any moment or around any corner or in any room, he may appear and Jill must be vigilant if she wants to survive. 
Remember when I said in my Resident Evil 2 review where I compared the series to the Alien franchise? Basically I said in my mouth that the original Resident Evil was like Alien while the sequel was like Aliens. Well Resident Evil 3 is like speed but if Keanu Reeves was also on speed. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis is an action packed escape movie in a video game form. The plot makes the player feel a constant sense of urgency. You feel the anxiety for the escape that Jill feels. You know just as well as she does that you need to get the fuck out of Raccoon City. It's desperation manifested. And since Jill knows this, she hasn't got time for anyone's shit. She is sassy, determined, confident, and more than aware and prepared for the task at hand. Jill has grown a lot since the original game, and it is greatly reflected in her character in Resident Evil 3. Carlos is an experienced mercenary with a soft side. He is quick to trust Jill and may even have romantic feelings for her, but considering she is the only woman he has had much contact with since the zombie apocalypse started, that isn't saying much. Unless he's a necrophiliac, then in that case, he's a fat kid in a mass graveyard, who truly wants to help as many people escape, and though he technically works for Umbrella, he doesn't share any of the evil traits of those associated with that company you usually have. Nikolai, on the other hand, is your typical evil Russian stereotype. I feel like every time he is by himself, he is sipping vodka in a dark room, smoking a cigar, and laughing maniacally and screaming about the motherland. That's a terrible fucking Russian impersonation. But he does have one or two interesting moments. But he just feels like somewhat of an afterthought. Like we all know Nemesis is the main threat, but the devs felt like they also needed a human antagonist. Like don't get me wrong though, I like how comically evil he is. And his ridiculous explanations when he's caught doing evil shit are fantastic. But I just wanted like a little bit more from him. The rest of the characters are pretty forgettable and mainly act as people to be killed later in the game. But a condensed cast means Resident Evil 3 really fleshes out Jill and Carlos, which I appreciated but I would have also liked a more rounded and interesting cast. Unlike Resident Evil 1 and 2, there is only one playable character in Resident Evil 3, that being Jill of course. Gone are the multiple characters with their own plot lines or the zapping system. But this does mean there is now one cohesive through line in terms of plot. Also it means the story is specifically built around Jill. It is distinctly her story. You could have featured some random new character, but I feel like this story really lets Jill become the character she is known for. You also play a brief segment as Carlos in the game, but I can't go into details about that because spoilers. But let's just say it's actually a decent idea. The developers clearly saw Resident Evil 2 in the moments where you played as a secondary character and realized that just doing this boring like block puzzle thing and just kind of just going on this really predictable route was kind of just, you know, shitty. So they actually had a whole segment dedicated to Carlos with his own unique area and all that stuff. So I kind of actually loved it. It was fun to play as Carlos. But that doesn't mean this plot doesn't try to include something new. So Resident Evil 3's addition to the branching storylines that were established in Resident Evil 2 is through two separate mechanics. The first and probably least important but still worth mentioning is certain story moments and character interactions can take place at different locations, thus causing them to play out somewhat differently, depending on the order in which the player explores the game. For example, in the early game you can encounter Carlos at either the restaurant or the press office, depending on which location you go to first. At these places, Jill and Carlos will encounter Nemesis, but this encounter will play out differently because you're at a different place. Though the consequences of these moments will always be the same, this mechanic occurs a lot throughout the game and with different characters and is a really nice touch. It adds some freshness upon multiple playthroughs. The second and probably most memorable inclusion are decisions. Throughout the game, certain set pieces will occur, such as running into Nemesis, encounters of large groups of zombies, or environmental hazards, and the player will be posed with two options, and a short time frame to choose one. Early examples range from whether or not to fight Nemesis at the police station, or choosing an escape route when Nemesis corners Jill and Carlos. Lots of the decisions revolve around Nemesis, but not all of them. Some of them can offer the player new areas to explore, items to get, or fights to fight in. You are never really punished for a decision you make, but they just offer some unique little things that can spice up repeat playthroughs. Unfortunately, besides the things I mentioned, these decisions don't have any effect on the story. Sure, certain moments might play out somewhat differently, but the core story will be unaffected. I would have preferred the decisions to have more weight. As without any sort of consequences, they just come across as being in the game for the sake of having something somewhat similar to multiple characters. It gets nowhere near to the replayability of multiple characters and barely holds a candle to the zapping system, but it is nice that the developers even included this considering the game's small development time. The overall story in Resident Evil 3 is pretty compelling and exciting. Deciding the centre of the plot around the escape from Raccoon City was a great idea as it really gets the adrenaline pumping and instills a sense of urgency, which is further reflected in the gameplay. I'll get to that later though. I always wanted to explore Raccoon City further when I played Resident Evil 2, and this game scratches that itch. Jill really gets her time to shine, and Carlos is a fun, albeit one-dimensional new character. Their interactions are easily the highlight of the game though. The inclusion of Nemesis as a threat is also a great addition, and perfectly expands upon the idea of an antagonist that was flirted with in Resident Evil 2. It is awesome to have this singular foe constantly hunting down Jill, and leads to some pretty great story moments. 
especially in the second half of the game. The other characters are just okay and aren't as fleshed out as those found in the predecessor, but they do the job they need to do and that's fine. I didn't enjoy this story quite as much as Resident Evil 2, but what is here is a fun, blockbuster romp through the streets of Raccoon City. Why isn't someone doing something about this? In my Resident Evil 2 review, I talked about in great detail how that gameplay started to flirt with the action genre. Well, Resident Evil 3 wants to take the action genre out to dinner, take it home, screw it and have little action babies. There are much more enemies, many more set pieces with explosions and whatnot. The whole game just feels more bombastic and chaotic, which I think perfectly reflects the apocalyptic, escape the city tone the game is going for. But that comes at the cost of the slower, atmospheric moments. They are still present, but just not nearly as much as before. Though, not all the tension is lost, and I will discuss that further when we get to the leather daddy. Okay, so gameplay wise, we are doing the same stuff as in previous games. All of the changes that were implemented in Resident Evil 2 are here and are looking as good as ever. So I won't be going over the stuff that I mentioned in my previous reviews because you know you can just watch them. And also if I have to talk about that shit for a third time, I will blow my fucking brains out. So we got tank controls, fixed camera angles, item management, limited saves, blah de blah blah. Everything is here and relatively the same, but I will go over the changes. Jill has some new and unique movement additions. Some great, another not so much. Firstly, she can perform a quick 180 degree turn. This is some good shit right here. No longer do you have to turn around at the speed and breadth of a truck stuck in mud. If you want to turn around quickly, you can just do it. This just speeds up the gameplay significantly, but can also be useful if you find yourself cornered by enemies and need to face them quickly. You can now just walk upstairs without the need of pressing a button. This may seem small in the grand scheme of things, but it's just another small twig that smooths out the gameplay and makes the world feel more connected and explorable as opposed to separate screens on a television. The one new thing that is basically useless is the dodge. If you press the shoot button at the right moment, Jill will perform a dodge. This game has a lot more enemies, some of which are very fast, so the dodge mechanic was included and you would think I would love it, but because it's mapped to the same button as shoot and the enemy's attack animations barely have a noticeable wind up, I never actually performed a dodge on purpose. Every time I performed it, it was by a complete accident. Like, I wanted to shoot this thing, not dodge out of the way unexpectedly. You can remap the controls on PC, which is what I was playing on, but even so, the enemies just don't give you enough of a heads up to perform it, which becomes a major problem when fighting Nemesis, but I will get into that later. Another change is the implementation of objects in the environment, such as explosive barrels, lanterns, and stuff of that ilk. Player can destroy these in order to kill a large group of enemies or harm others, including Nemesis. Though nothing new in video games, their implementation in the Resident Evil franchise feels somewhat fresh. These objects are restricted to specific areas and can sometimes feel out of place, like why are they large exploding barrels littered around the streets of an American town. You know how Americans are with guns, so it seems like these are just accidents waiting to happen. But it does give the player more combat options and requires them to analyze the environment to take advantage of combat opportunities. I didn't use these too often as I tried to avoid combat, but when stuck in a tight situation, or forced into some instances via scripted events, these objects were a great way to clear a crowd of zombies. We've also got some new items and weapons to mess around with. The big new item is ammunition powder that comes in a variety of types and sizes, depending on which ones you combine, you can make pistol rounds, shotgun rounds, and grenade rounds. The ammo crafting mechanic is pretty straightforward and has some pros and cons. The benefit is that you can craft the ammo you want, depending on whether you have the right resources of course. So if you prefer a certain weapon or a desperate need of a specific ammo type, you have the freedom to make it. You can also create enhanced ammo which is more powerful than the standard stuff. But where I found this to be a problem is that items in this game are randomized. So ammo, herbs, and ink ribbons are just thrown about the map, and I must have had the worst luck because I could barely find any ammo ammunition, let alone ammo powder. In a game where the player was encouraged to kill more enemies than ever before, this was the only classic Resident Evil game where I felt like I never had any ammo. Same goes for health and ink ribbons. I was just always so low on them. That could have just been my luck or item mismanagement, but I thought I was always pretty frugal. Before ammo and items would be meticulously placed so the player always had just enough to get by if they played right. But now this is all left up to RNG, at least I think the majority of it is. This game doesn't feel as balanced in the item department. It does keep the game somewhat fresh and unpredictable, and does emphasize the tension that comes with limited resources, but it comes at the sacrifice of a more cleaner and balanced design. The new guns are the Assault Rifle and the Mine Thrower, and some upgraded versions of the Shotgun and Magnum if you successfully down Nemesis in some fights with him. Basically, they work the same as their counterparts in Resident Evil 2. They shoot things better. The Assault Rifle though is so fucking fun to use. It feels great just to fucking gun down a large group of zombies or hunters or whatever. I loved whenever I got the chance to use this because it just felt super cathartic to unleash on these assholes. My favourite moment is when you're playing as Carlos in the hospital and this elevator door opens up and all these zombies are there and the game's just like, go on, fucking kill them all. And I did. 
and it was fun. But the same can't be said for the mine thrower. What even is this thing? Like, I know what it is. It launches mines that explode when enemies get close to them. But why is it in this game? Why is it in a game with fixed camera angles and pre-rendered backgrounds? I could never exactly pinpoint where I was aiming or where the mines landed, which is kind of important with a weapon that requires precise aiming. I honestly don't know why this gun is in this game, so for that reason, it remained in the item box shortly after I picked it up. Resident Evil 3 is also just a lot harder. It's the only game in the series where I died numerous times, and honestly, that was a bit refreshing. There are just so many monsters, and Nemesis is such a fucking beast that I just died and died and died and died and died. It made the enemies scary and tense again. I actually worried about dying, and that was something I haven't felt throughout the majority of my time with the Resident Evil series. It can be a bit cheap sometimes, mainly when it comes to Nemesis, but I will get into that later, but I am stoked that this game isn't a cakewalk. <laughs> Who oh boy. I have a sordid history with the Resident Evil puzzles. Basically, I don't think they qualify as puzzles. And in my Resident Evil 2 review, I said that I've come to accept the Resident Evil series has shitty and easy puzzles, and I thought I was done. Well, Resident Evil 3 wasn't the place I expected for the puzzles to stump me so bad, several times I might add, that I actually had to resort to looking up the answers, because I'm a big dum-dum. The standard put things in things so-called puzzles still remain in Resident Evil 3, and they haven't changed in any way, and will make up most of the puzzles in the game. But the game also includes include some puzzles that involve matching an image on a screen, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Listening to two musical boxes play portions of a song to then go to a third and combine the two tunes to make a cohesive song. All this bloody head scratcher involving analyzing crystals to put in the correct time on these clocks. I still don't know how to do this. This thing stumped me and I had to look up a guide. And because the puzzles are also somewhat randomized, this took a while. But honestly, I was so happy to stumble across puzzles in this game that actually involved me to use my noggin. And I think there is only like one block puzzle and it's super quick. I am so happy about this. I would like to thank all my family and friends who don't watch my videos and all my subscribers who put up with my nonsense. Seriously though, these puzzles are a massive improvement over the prior two games. It feels like the devs really got out of the established ideas of what a resi puzzle could be and did something new and I am grateful for that. But now we're talking about the head scratch and stuff, we gotta talk about the shooty shooty bang bang who we kill and stuff. We got a familiar cast of enemies in Resident Evil 3. Zombies, zombie dogs, crows and spiders all make an appearance as per usual but I won't be talking about those as they work in the same way as in previous games. Though there are so many more enemies in the game which really lends to the feeling they are overwhelming the city, which I thought was an awesome touch and yet again further steps into the action genre. But let's talk about the new additions. First up is the Drain Demos. I think that's how you pronounce it, and Brain Sucker. The former are apparently fleas that have been affected by the T-Virus. I'm assuming maybe they drank the blood of infected animals, I don't know. Anyway, these guys are big gross looking things that want to drink blood. Same goes for the latter, but they're a bit more tougher. Drain Demos are pretty intimidating at first glance, but once you realize a trusty shotgun can take them down pretty easy, they aren't a big deal. The Brain Suckers are a bit more of a challenge, but by the time you encounter them, you will be equipped with a grenade launcher, so they are pretty easy to kill as well. What makes these guys somewhat difficult to kill is their sporadic movement. They can jump around and crawl on walls, so you'll need to avoid their attacks and wait for them to stop moving so you can get a clean shot. The next new enemy is a Ricka Ricka remix of an old one. This lovely fellow is the Hunter Beta, and the player first encounters them in the hospital. These hunters are a little bit more fucked up looking compared to their RE1 counterparts, hence the whole Beta thing. They act much like the original hunters do. They move fast, can jump around and all that stuff. Basically, they just feel like a reskin of the Hunter, so not much new to report on that front, but they are still pretty dangerous, but nothing the grenade launcher or shotgun can't handle. Finally are the Hunter Gammas, and Wow, these things are super fucking disappointing. They are an alternative form of the hunter designed for chilling out in water. The hunter gamma are generally weaker than the standard hunter, but can jump much further. They are first encountered in the basement of the hospital, but instead of hanging around to see what they did, I just kind of hoofed it out of there. The problem with these guys is they are designed to stalk the waters, and since the game takes place in a massive city, there isn't really that many opportunities for them to actually be around. In fact, I think I barely have enough footage of them for this section of the video. Their design is pretty interesting, like a frog-like thing, but I just wish I had more opportunities to encounter them. One interesting thing about the enemies is that their placement is also randomized. I don't know if this is for all enemies throughout the entire game, but it is definitely for certain locations. Meaning you may enter an area infested with hunters, and if you die and go to the same place again, this time prepared to fight what killed you, it may be populated by sliding worms, which are another type of enemy, but one I barely encountered, so I'm not gonna fucking talk about them really. This keeps the game's unpredictability both upon death and multiple playthroughs. Learning enemy locations was an extremely important piece of information in the previous games, and the player could use that information while backtracking or upon deaths. But in Resident Evil 3, the tension of exploring areas remains
experience high as the player never really knows what to expect. This does mean that the perfect placement of the older enemies is somewhat gone, but this random element of the game is something I really appreciate. Now we get on to the big boy. Nemesis is the big new thang in Resident Evil 3. So much so that his name is plastered on the box alongside his handsome mug. Ooh. Hello. As I mentioned before, he is yet another one of Umbrella's fun little science experiments designed to hunt down the members of RPD Stars Unit. Basically, it's just like testing out if he can do it, I think. His design, though, is iconic. His body wrapped in leather, tubes piercing his skin, which is decayed and torn. His dead eyes alongside his beautifully white teeth make him such a memorable foe. And if you play your cards right, a memorable lover. Remember Mr. X from Resident Evil 2? I like his inclusion in the B scenario as it was a way of keeping the player on their toes. My biggest issue with that lumbering buffoon is that he wasn't really a threat and was restricted to only a few specific moments in the game. In my review, I talked about how I wanted him to stalk the player, and I wish he was more versatile as a foe. Instead, he was just a guy who would occasionally remind you we existed from time to time. Nemesis, on the other hand, is everything I wanted from Mr. X. For better, and for worse. Nemesis is dangerous. He's extremely fast, has numerous attacks that can hit from close or long distance. He hits like a fucking truck and takes a lot of ammunition to put him on the ground. You encounter him in several scripted sequences, but what makes him an actual prominent threat is he will stalk the player throughout most of the game. Whether indoors or outdoors, Nemesis is always hunting you. And even when he isn't, it still feels like he is. You could be wandering around the city streets and he will just sprint down the road with murder on the mind. Or you could be exploring indoors and he will smash through a window and chase you through every room, killing anything, even zombies and other monsters that get in the way of his goal, killing you. Hardly anywhere is safe. You can't just move to the next room and think you'll be all good because Nemesis can do something that Mr. X can't. That is open doors. This made me say, oh fuck out loud. The presence of Nemesis makes Resident Evil 3 one of the most tension-filled experiences I've ever had, and for the first playthrough, he could be a fucking nightmare. By and large, a lot of Resident Evil 3 is pretty standard Resident Evil, but what Nemesis does is makes the player have to do the Resident Evil stuff while under duress. By the third entry, players have become accustomed to the Resident Evil formula. We all know what we need to do when we boot up one of these games. Run around, solve puzzles, dodge enemies, etc. Throwing Nemesis into the mix forces the player to re-evaluate situations and paths in a new and unique way and he makes backtracking also so much more fucking dangerous. Sure, there were always obstacles in the player's path they needed to consider in previous games, as that is a quintessential aspect of the survival horror genre, but all the planning in the world, all the item management, strategic play, and map memorization can get thrown out the window when you have a hulking behemoth you saying bolting towards you of the intent of murder. It makes Resident Evil 3 unlike any other entry in the franchise, and honestly, no other game in the series up to now has been able to capture this kind of panic that Nemesis makes the player experience. But all of this can also be a little bit frustrating and Nemesis can turn into an annoyance. I had a few moments where all I wanted to do was progress in the game, but Nemesis would always show up at the worst times. Now I just spent some time praising how he does that, but because I didn't have enough resources or didn't want to waste someone trying to down him for a period of time, he would turn from an ongoing threat into a bit of an annoying roadblock. Like I just wanted to grab something or explore an area more thoroughly, but I couldn't do that because this fast motherfucker just wouldn't let me. So instead of soaking in this game in the world, I was forced to either run back to a safe room or just run to the next portion to progress. His speed and tactical options made trying to just avoid him while trying to do what I wanted to do nearly impossible. I will talk more about how the game wasn't completely balanced around an enemy with such a unique moveset and combat set in the boss section, but for now I just wanted to say that he can be a bit annoying when you want to soak in the atmosphere or just explore, which is something that always hooked me when playing Resident Evil. There are sections where you can do this as you will take a break from chasing you for a bit, so in these moments you can really explore and prepare. But in a game where the player is required to really prepare themselves for what is to come, more so than any other game, Nemesis can interfere with that and leave the player unprepared for later parts. This is the only Resi game where I truly felt items were limited, which I know is a major part of Resident Evil, and I believe one of the reasons is because Nemesis stopped me from stocking up. The ammo crafting system may have been a way to accommodate for this, but you still need to explore to grab the ammo powder so the issue persists. This isn't a major problem though, but I thought I should acknowledge it. If you do have the confidence to fight and kill Nemesis, he will be kind enough to drop some items. These range from weapon parts that, when combined, create new and more powerful weapons, or packs of first aid sprays. This really rewards the player for threatening their life and wasting their ammo to take down Nemesis. Now, I never did this because I fucking suck at fighting Nemesis, but if I had the confidence, I would have really loved a bigger shotgun. Overall, Nemesis was a breath of fresh air. Three games here, the devs knew they needed to really mix things up to keep things from getting stale, and since they had such a small development time, Nemesis was a great way of innovating and keeping things fresh, 
finish without having to overhaul the core gameplay, but also making the core gameplay more intense. He does everything that Mr. X couldn't do, and he makes Resident Evil 3 one of the most nail-bitingly tense horror games of all time, in my opinion. But now we talked about the enemies, we gotta get on to the big bad bosses. And yet again, I got a wish fulfilled. In my Resident Evil 2 review, I said I enjoyed Birkin as a main antagonist, who the player fights several times, but in order to keep these encounters fresh, he transforms, which changes his movement and attack capabilities. But he wasn't as persistent. Nemesis is the main antagonist of Resident Evil 3, and he will be the main boss the player fights. Though you can fight him when you run into the boy within the streets or other places, there are several actual boss fights with him, and with each fight, he mutates, giving some new attacks and keeping the fights fresh. These are fucking hard. Nemesis's fast speed and vast movement set aren't too much of a problem in the open setting of the game, where you're going from place to place and exploring, but the boss fights are restricted to certain confined areas, and he can quickly become overwhelming. The main problem is that he's just so fucking fast. I kept trying to get some distance between him and I so I could do some damage, but every time I tried, he would quickly close the gap and hit me as I was pulling out my gun. So boss fights would turn into this weird cat and mouse back and forth between us until one of us was dead. Most of the time, it was me. Now I know in my previous reviews, I wish boss fights demanded more from the player than just running from one corner to another and shooting the boss until they are dead. And I know I said those fights were too easy, but this seems like an overcorrection. And also, the boss fights are built around the dodge button working when the player wanted. But as I mentioned before, the dodge doesn't really work as intended. So you constantly fight this fast, tough enemy and the only tool that you have at your disposal that can make these fights somewhat even between the pair of you doesn't even work. Even though I am complaining about these, I am so glad the boss fights with Nemesis are the way they are. It was like a shock to the system in the first fight. I thought to myself, oh, so shit is hard now. Okay, I'm fucking down. Every fight with Nemesis was extremely tense and exhilarating, with some frustrations at times. One of the fights also have several options in dealing damage. You can shoot these pipes or whatever to spill acid or something on him, which does deal some good damage and saves ammo. I like screamed thank you at my screen when I realized this. But also Nemesis being the actual antagonist makes all these boss fights feel like they have meaning. Nemesis is the culmination of two games worth of boss designs and address nearly every problem I have with them in prior games. I do wish the dodge mechanic worked so I had some more options because without it, I am just still running around in circles like in the other games. But Nemesis even made doing that repetitive thing feel like I was pulling off intricate combat maneuvers. Nemesis isn't the only boss fight though. There is this worm. Fighting him is shit and easy. That's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> The quality of environments haven't changed much since Resident Evil 2, which is not an insult because that game blew me away of how good it looked, so the same goes here. Shit looks nice, but where there is a major improvement is just how much is going on in these backgrounds. Because the game is set during the midst of a zombie apocalypse, the developers went absolutely crazy and the streets of Raccoon City encapsulate this craziness. Buildings and storefronts are destroyed, their windows shattered and the insides have been destroyed and ransacked. Cars remain vacant in the aftermath of a crash, their metal crumpled and scratched. Their windows remain open as though something pulled out the drivers. Even some people who have turned into zombies lay in waiting for the right moment to launch at their next meal. Rubbish, broken glass, blood and bodies litter the streets. Those who are lucky remain corpses, those who aren't, get back up. Fires burn uncontrollably while smoke consumes the streets. New 3D environmental effects add a nice layer of atmosphere. Bugs will circle around a street lamp and rain will pour from the pitch black sky. There are many alleys, buildings and areas a player can explore and it's an awesome change of pace from the level design in previous games. There are so many interesting and unique places to go to and though the player will run into a lot of straight lines while exploring Raccoon City, it feels more alive and believable because the game is set in a city. The streets of Raccoon City have been painted with a brush of indiscriminate violence and every nook and cranny of the environment tells their own unique story of suffering and it's fucking beautiful. We get to visit a familiar place as well, that being the police department, but a little more barricaded as Jill takes a trip there before it's completely destroyed. It is really cool to come back here and get to explore it during a different period of time. It is a lot more shut off than in the original though. You only go there for a minute, explore a few rooms and leave. But it was fun to actually have Jill, a member of Stars, be able to explore her workplace. I just wish she had some unique dialogue though. I would have liked to see her comment about the Arclay Mansion incident or talk about West when you check her desk. Instead, I think most of the text is just copied straight from Resident Evil 2, which is kind of lame. I would have also liked to see some other police officers there as well. Like, it would have been kind of cool just to have, like, more people, like, more actual alive people in this game. But hey, we got a couple. The rest of the areas are pretty varied as well. The player will explore cemeteries, a fucking awesome clock tower, a creepy park, a hospital, and of course, another umbrella lap. These guys sure like building those. But what I love about Resident Evil 3 is that it addresses one of the main problems of the previous games. That being, they become a straight line to the finish once the player gets out of the main area. But Capcom must have time traveled and watched my videos because in Resident Evil 3, the game is smaller but more open areas reminiscent of the Spencer Mansion or RPD. The game's pacing is 
so much better for it. It doesn't feel like the game is rushing me to the end, even though it would have been thematically appropriate in this entry. Resident Evil 3 just feels more consistent in terms of its levels. Not spending loads of times in one place and then blitzing past several areas in a dizzy haze is just such a better experience. The clock tower is awesome to wander around in. It has this gothic mansion vibe similar to the Spencer Mansion. Each room is something cool to look at. The park is really atmospheric, place full of tight walkways and dark corners. I also imagine this place is just creepy even without the whole zombie apocalypse thing going on. The hospital is a really fucking cool place to explore and I'm surprised it took two games to kind of get here. Like of course you want to explore a hospital in a zombie outbreak, like, that's just like the best place to have a look in. The lab is just a lab but it does offer some unique areas with interesting enemy placements that makes it feel really dangerous. Resident Evil 3 allows the player to really explore several locations in Raccoon City and really get a feel for the mood of the place. I wish Resident Evil 2 did this a bit more because it just feels right in a series such as this. The actual character models in Resident Evil 3 have received a slight downgrade. Nothing too drastic but it was very noticeable when I booted up the game for the first time on my PC. I thought I did something wrong but nah. This is just how the game looks. Models are still detailed, but look a little bit more muddy. And each character does have a distinct look, and their designs are still memorable as well. But the reason why the graphics dropped a little was because the game was pushing the limit of how many enemies you could have in one screen or in one area. There are fucking loads of undead and monsters created in a lab wandering around. The zombies especially look awesome, as their models are way more varied than both prior Resident Evil games. The lower visual quality is a clear design sacrifice in order to really capture the mood of a zombie apocalypse. I wouldn't have believed a few zombies and monsters here and there could have overthrown an entire city. So the devs knew they needed to show the sheer size of the outbreak at the cost of some muddier visuals. And honestly, I think it was a good decision. Overall, the visuals, the environment, and the level design feel like a breath of fresh air for the series. It addressed all my problems and then some. The static backgrounds are the best in the series so far, and though the models look a little bit worse, that is more than made up with the sheer size of the outbreak. Because if it wasn't believable, it would have taken away from the frantic and intense nature of the game. But thankfully, Capcom made Resident Evil 3 look and feel like a city overrun by the undead dead and I loved exploring every single area. No! This is the first time me talking about the music and sound, so be gentle. The music in Resident Evil 3 retains that classic atmospheric sound the series is known for, but contorts itself to match the frantic tone of this game. Lots of tracks feature action movie style orchestra sounds, big booming strings, and even distorted bass lines, but with a Resident Evil twist. The song Watch Your Back is a great example of this. It feels haunting, the strings are twisted, shifting in pitch within one note, making the track feel dreamlike, but with sharp notes piercing the ears, giving that sense of urgency. While the track Unstoppable Nemesis is the perfect music to accompany that big boy. It is booming. There's crashing sounds in the background accompanied by sharp strings, while other strings comprise the melody. Every instrument is designed to make Nemesis sound menacing. But then you have tracks like Valediction in the Park, which harken back to the more somber and creepy tones found in Resident Evil 1. They feature low drones echoing in the background, again with the strings, but they hold their notes for much longer than in the more frantic songs, providing an eerie soundscape. These songs are the perfect accompaniment to the more slower, atmospheric, and exploratory moments of the game. The music does a great job at providing tones for both the creepier parts of Resident Evil 3 and the more action-packed, frantic moments. And some tracks even seamlessly transition between the two. I think this is some peak music right here. It nails everything the game was going for tonally and made an already and creepy, frantic game that much more creepy and frantic. The sound design and voice acting is also top-notch, well, for Resident Evil at least. All the weapons, monsters, and environmental sounds are really really fucking good. The weapons pack a serious punch. The pistol still sounds kind of meh like it always has in Resident Evil, but the shotgun, grenade launcher, and magnum all pack a wallop. They really sound like they are devastating weapons, and I don't know about you, but I would not like to be shot by them. All the monsters sound basically the same as they did before, but just a bit cleaner and more distinct, which is a triumph considering how many more of them are on the screen at once. But easily, the environmental sounds are my favourite. Though most of the game is frantic like I have mentioned many, many times, Resident Evil 3 also has got quiet moments, and that is when we really get to hear such an awesome soundscape. Jill's steps echo through the back alleys of Raccoon City. You can hear zombies munching on someone from beyond the next screen, but you don't know exactly where they are, so that screen transition is very tense. Hearing Nemesis sprinting towards you from somewhere unseen is one of the most fucking crazy things I've ever experienced. The sound design 
Gun in general is just treated with such care to really elevate the game and provide scares before the player even knows what they should be scared of. The voice acting is as cheesy as ever, and that is damn alright with me. Jill is much more of a character in this game, and that is purely based on her delivery. She is more sarcastic, and that is perfectly delivered in the actor's vocal performance. Considering Umbrella caused all this in the first place, those liars! Jill just always sounds cynical. Like, she is constantly thinking, not this shit again. Carlos sounds less like a hardened mercenary, more like an office worker who wouldn't hurt a fly. You're giving up? No. I just... Can't handle it! His voice actor can be a bit cringy at times too, but he doesn't sound too out of place, I guess. Nikolai sounds like someone doing a really bad impression of a Russian accent, like he just sounds too evil, as though he's in a film about the Red Scare or something. It does match the cheesy tone though, so it was actually enjoyable to hear this evil fucker just be evil and enjoy it. What did you do? I had no choice. He was about to turn into a zombie. It would have been a threat, so I eliminated it. Three games in and the voice acting has improved so fucking much from the original. Every character still has that B-movie charm that was unintentionally established in the first one, but it has grown up alongside the franchise to offer a more rounded and somewhat serious livery, especially when the script calls for it. But Jill is easily the standout character and so far, she is my favourite character in the franchise based purely on how she sounds and acts in this game. <laughs> Resident Evil 3 is a beast of a game to play. I have rarely experienced something so tense and it is the first entry in the series that actually kept me on the edge of my seat. It was an uncomfortable time as well, which makes me hesitant to go back and play it as much as 2. But that's not me saying this isn't a good game, it's a fucking great game. It perfectly executes the tone it was going for, introduces the best version of Jill, explores an iconic location, and features one of the most memorable enemies in all of horror games. Nemesis is truly the shining point of this game. He elevates it from just being a standard Resident Evil game and makes it one of true chaos. The puzzles finally resemble puzzles, and there are hardly any box puzzles either which arouses me, and I haven't felt anything in years. The level design is finally more open throughout the entire game, and the environments look fucking amazing. The music is chaotic and atmospheric, and the environmental sounds provide some truly disturbing moments. The story is an action blockbuster set in a zombie infested city with an antagonist who was actually intimidating. Every aspect of the game still falls into some Resident Evil cliches here and there, but those parts are so fucking charming they can't be mad at them. But Resident Evil 3 will kick you in the ass a lot on your first playthrough. And though it can feel a bit cheap sometimes, I think the decision to ramp up the difficulty was a great idea as the previous two games were just too easy. Resident Evil 3 should not be the first game in the series you play, but you also should not skip it. It feels like this game is Capcom challenging the diehard of Resident Evil fans. You reckon you know this series and can speedrun any game first go? Well fuck you bitches, here's Nemesis. I loved my time with Resident Evil 3 Nemesis and dreaded having to pick it up again for this review, and I believe that perfectly encapsulates just how great of a survival horror game it is. I want to thank everyone again for joining me on this little Resident Evil journey. I'm going to take a break from Resident Evil because I have done a lot of videos in this series over the past month and I actually want to cover different horror stuff. Stuff that a lot of people haven't heard about or maybe some stuff that really gets brought up but should. You can support the channel on Patreon for as little as $1. I will be redoing some of the tiers soon but as of now you can get access to my videos one day early, my Discord and a monthly Q&A video. They're all going to stay the same, I just want to add some extra stuff as well. Once I figure out what that new stuff will be coming to Patreon, I will We'll talk about it in a channel update video, but of course, if money gets too tight, please stop contributing. I will completely understand. Usually I will do shout outs for Patreon to contribute at $3 or higher, but fuck that, I'm going to shout out everyone during the We Don't Talk About It pandemic. So thank you to Colby Ball, Joey Monster, Milo and Dotus, Randolph Sandolf, Sam Barclay, Slight of Tongue, Walter and Devin John Malone. And to everybody else, I hope my videos alleviate some of the boredom during isolation, and I will see you all in the next one.